Well, November is prime time. You know, it's what we wait for all, all hunting season long, all year long, playing for it, and uh, now it's here. And I wanted to help you guys navigate through November because to me, there's a lot of fails we'll talk about in another video, but there's a lot of things you can do to really control your level of success. And that's kind of what the theme of November is to take control of your success. And I believe you can do that. So many people worry about their neighbors, what the DNR is doing, whatever, but if you hunt well, then you take back a lot of the control that you have in your destiny for your hunt. And there's no greater month for deer hunting to me than November. So right off the bat, if you want to sit every day, that's okay. You know, some people have the rutcation nine days off from a Friday to the following Sunday. And you're going to go out and sit every day. And I can talk about till I'm blue in the face, you know, really hit the best weather days. And I have a tendency to do that. I can hit the best weather days when I want. We work in between. We're shooting videos right now in between hunting this morning and hunting this afternoon. So I have to work all the time and I, and I, I can choose when to hunt and that's a good thing. But uh, bottom line is I can be a little bit more choosy. Maybe you can't. Hunt every day. Maybe you can be choosy and you still want to hunt every day. But... One of the biggest keys to that, save your best stands for the best days, your worst stands for the worst days. And what I mean by that is, you know, this morning I went out and it's a, it's a warmer day, October 25th. It's October 25th though. It's a good day to hunt, but it's foggy this morning. We had really bad thunderstorms uh, yesterday or some flooding in the area to the north a little bit. Um, now it's going to be about 13 degree difference between yesterday and today. I like that, especially for this afternoon. But everything wasn't dried out yet. It was still dripping off the trees. There's still fog in the area. It just ended up being a few hours off. I think this afternoon's going to be better. Bottom line is when you see that kind of day coming, you know, it's unseasonably warm, a little bit windy, maybe still have some weather working its way through. Just pick a stand that's out of the way a little bit. Save that best stand. And what I find on the best stands is they become better as time goes on when you don't use them. Neighbors help you greatly. Mature bucks, as you get in more to the peak rut, you don't know what stand they're going to go by. So if you're at a best stand that relates to good funnels, good transition areas from bedding to feeding, thick cover, then you know the odds really heat up. So I like saving those best stands for the best conditions. Even if you're going to hunt every day. So that's one way you can manage your sets. And a lot of this has to do with uh, sit management and kind of managing your hunt. Because ultimately, you can have the best habitat in the world, but if you hunt it poorly, the best habitat in the world actually makes things worse. So you really have to hunt properly and hunt well, no matter if you're hunting on public or private land. Number two, still use caution. This is a hard one. Use caution every day of that. And maybe the last day of your nine day rutcation, you want to go right in the middle of the bedding area and sit all day, you know, have at it. But up until that time, still use caution. Be very careful where you blow your wind. Be very careful how you access your stands, what stands you use, when you get into them, how you go around bedding areas. Don't take the lazy way and go right through an area. Go the long ways around still. You know, look at it as if it's early October and you're like, I want to be really careful. And then all of a sudden, early November, you just throw it all to the wind and go hunt and ruin your hunt. It's, you know, talk about all the time, the season's a marathon, not a sprint. Number three, to me, there's three distinct differences between stands. One is a morning stand, one is a midday stand, and one is an afternoon stand. Rarely is a morning stand an all-day stand. Rarely is an afternoon stand a morning stand. And the reason I say that is because morning stands relate to bedding, if you go into a small food source, if you go into a big food source that you might sit near in the afternoon, you spook those deer out in the morning because they're out in the fields. They're already there. They're there before it gets daylight. So you ruin your hunt before it even begins. And that's why this stand separation is so critical. Afternoon relates to food. Morning relates to bedding. So what about that midday time? You know, a lot of people talk about well, midday is my best time to see bucks. And I believe that, especially in high pressure states. Because people are getting out of their stands at lunchtime, they're bumping deer. Especially small woodlot areas. Someone's hunting a 10 acre woodlot, they got in safely in the morning, wait for the deer to come back, and then they get out and booger up the whole woods. The whole woods clears out, runs a quarter or a half mile across the ag fields is another spot. That can happen very, very easily. 
what I find in more natural settings, you know, uh, big wilderness areas, yeah, bucks can move all day long. You never know when they're going to go by. Some of the big public land tracks that I'm at, been to, you never know when that buck's going to come by during the rut. He might be two miles away when you get into your stand in the morning, an area like that. A lot of times on mixed ag like where we're at, well, I think back to a good friend of mine, Tim and I, we were hunting, I believe it was 2004. And we sat four days, dark to dark, never got above 40 degrees. And most of the morning lows were right around the teens to 20. So we sat dark to dark. And sometimes we'd change a stand. But the bottom line is we were out in the woods hunting all day long. And with, maybe we changed the stand, but we went 100 yards over to that one and we got out and got over there and changed when we thought the, the getting was good. We didn't see, we saw 26 bucks, 26 different bucks we talked about between the two of us. We didn't see one buck between 11 and 130. And I always remember that, I always stuck in my head because it was a cold, early November, end of October set, I think it was the last day of October, first three days of November, something like that, or the first four days of November. But I remember how many bucks we saw, how often they were moving all portions of the day except that midday time. And I'm not saying that midday is a terrible time to hunt. I'm just saying it has its places and it doesn't have its places. So it's easy to say, well, midday. But what is a midday stand? To me, it's a combination of your morning stand and your afternoon stand. It's something in between. It's not at the food. It's not at the bedding area. It's in a thick area. It's somewhere where you can say, you know what, I can see deer. This makes sense that deer would be coming past me in the morning, but I'm not spooking them out of their food sources to get into the stand. On the flip side, I can see deer moving past this area from their bedding area to get to the food source in the afternoon. Therefore, it makes it that if a buck is moving midday, he's going to be moving in that perfect X where he feels comfortable. He's not popping out to the daylight of a food source. He's not at the bedding area. Think about a bedding area. The closer it gets to dark, the more deer leaving bedding areas to go to food sources. So I don't want to be at a bedding area stand in the afternoon. The last two, three hours can be real duds because the deer are working, especially bucks looking for does, are working closer to those food sources. So learn the differences between those stands and how to manage getting in and out. And uh, that'll pay off really well. Number four, long weekends rule. If I had a choice of just hunting nine days in a row if i had a choice i know not everyone does you got to put your vacation time in and early but folks that is a small percentage of you out there not everyone has to put their vacation in in january or february i know that that's the way it is in some locations but it's not it's not a majority and even so if you want to plan your time out i'd rather hit lots of portions of the rut i want to hunt the entire rut because i don't know what buck you're after Maybe you're after a target buck and that would be you want to hunt him in the pre-rut because you don't know where he's at in the peak rut or post-rut. Maybe you're after a buck on someone else's land because you don't have anything in the early season. Well, then you need to hunt the peak rut and the post-rut because you don't know what you're after. You're just hoping one comes by. The bottom line is if you hit weekends, say three long weekends in a row, four or five day weekends, you hit them every weekend, well, then you get to go back and see your family get to hang out with your friends in between maybe they're hunting too whatever you would go back to work get caught up on work stuff then you go back refreshed and it's not only you being refreshed but more importantly the land in your tree stands then you also get to take base maybe that maybe the first weekend's a dud but the second two weekends are great maybe all three are great maybe one out of three is great but rest assured if you hunt nine days a lot of times you burn out your land in your stand unless you have 500 to a thousand acres or more you just don't have enough stands or areas to move around without spooking deer. We're not hunting public land. Public land is different. If you have five different areas over a few miles that you can that you can really have scouted and you're ready to hunt, well, then you can manage a nine-day hunt because you can hunt a couple days here, a couple days there. This area seems hot. I'll spend four days here. Maybe I'll spend some time here, let it cool off, come back at the end of the hunt. You have options. On, on private land, you don't. Everyone thinks, well, we'll hunt private land and it's going to be easier. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. The problem is if you don't manage your hunt, public land's way better because if I mess up my property, it doesn't matter if it's 500 acres, 200 acres, or 20. If I mess it up, I'm done. Public land, I just move. You can't move a mile on most private land parcels unless you're incredibly wealthy or hunting a giant private parcel. Most people don't have that luxury to just go move a mile because you buggered up this area. And when you bugger up an area, think about deer always run a half mile. They don't run 100 yards, look back and just hang out and stop. They run a long ways. 
to get away from you. And if it's a mature buck, he ain't coming back. Look at it that way. So those long weekends, I love that because then it spreads out my risk, lets the property heal, it becomes fresh, your stands stay fresh, and you get to experience all phases of the rut, and that'll help you narrow down a certain buck that may or may not be on your land if you just go out for a week straight. Folks, it's time for the rut, and that means you need to check out my rut web class. It'll help you navigate the entire rut, but more importantly, Quiet Cat is one of our important partners and through that partnership, they've offered to clients, people that contact us, an incredible discount and opportunity to buy a new Quiet Cat. Look for an email that you can contact and the contact information in the description, but I really want to pass that off to you. Um, we don't do that very often, but I want to make sure you guys don't miss out if you're looking and in the market for a new Quiet Cat. Long mornings rule. Boy, I've shot a lot of deer towards that 10 11 time where I didn't see anything for the first couple hours. It was October 25th. I didn't see any deer. I remember sitting and it had been about two hours and I had three and a half hours to sit and it didn't even bother me too much. You know, it was, it was slow. I'll, I'll put it that way. All the cameras are slow. That bothered me because you know, things aren't moving in two states. But bottom line is when it gets into this rut this time of year, if I haven't seen anything for the first couple hours, I can remember a sit in Wisconsin, beautiful chilly morning, I'm sure there's a bunch of deer out on the food sources. I get into the stand. It was where I shot Diego. Mm -hmm. Don't you know where that stand? And so I remember I got into that stand and I didn't see anything for the first two and two and two and a half hours. I sat till about noon or one. And by the end of that sit, I'd seen about 26 deer and maybe seven or eight bucks. It was an incredible morning. One of my best ever. I don't normally see that many deer. It was an incredible morning. You know, morning of the ages, but the first two hours, it seemed like a dud. The point is, plan on sitting until 11 or 12. And what I do is, if you have that flexibility, again, thinking that I'm better off focusing on those last two, three hours of afternoon, evening, in an actual evening stand. Yes, I move a lot. So I'll sit here in the morning, there in the evening, because I want to get the best of each time. That's part of that sit, sit management. But I want to make sure I sit till 11 at least or noon and i'll look at it like man if i if i say i'm going to sit till noon and i see a bunch of deer activity like quarter to 12 well and i'm not getting out i'll say well, i'm gonna sit for another hour it might be heating up now and then if it's i sit there you know past noon it gets 12 15 12 30 i'm not seeing anything well definitely i'm getting out at one i usually look at in increments of either a half hour or hour i say i'm going to sit till this time and then i get out but think about that those long mornings bucks are a lot more active during the morning hours three times more than the afternoon, evening, you know, right before dark. So they might move for four or five, six hours in the morning. They might move for an hour or two after dark. They have to take rest, just like you or I. They can't just keep rutting 24 hours straight for three weeks. They have to take breaks. Think of how hard they're working all night long. Those, some of those bucks have a three or four or more home, home uh, range, uh, mile, uh, three or four mile home range. So they can be all over the place and they have to rest at some point. And I find that's during the middle of the day, and that's a good time to go over and get into an afternoon stand, part of that set management. But boy, those mornings. If I had to choose, uh, definitely, I'd rather choose, let's say if I just threw, threw some numbers out here, I'll, I'll pick uh, November 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. I'll hunt only mornings there during that time, as opposed to two weeks of evenings. I'd rather sit those mornings, because I look at it like I have three times the likelihood I'm gonna see something in the morning and that's when I've shot a lot of my best bucks. Probably 70% of them have been shot in, those, in the morning, sometime during the rut in November. Number six, avoid last minute brush-ins. What I mean by that, how many of you go out right before gun season and say, you know what, it's gun season tomorrow, a lot of people are moving around the woods right now, so I'm gonna brush in a, a blind. I'm gonna put a pop-up out, brush it in. It's one thing putting a pop-up out in a stealthy manner, you know, putting it somewhere, Dylan and I were discussing, boy, it was a few years ago, and I can't remember if Dante sat with him or Jake. I think it was Dante the first day sat with you, maybe. But regardless, it was 50 mile an hour winds the day before. Pretty easy to go in and put a pop-up out and get out because deer aren't moving around, except for the 50 mile an hour wind caught the pop-up, blew it off the bluff, and went way down in the woods. And I'd go down there right in a big bedding area and smash all around to get the pop-up. Big fail on my part. And how many deer did you see the next day? Zero? Uh, yeah, we didn't see, it. see much. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> it was a bad day. 
So, but that can happen. It's so tempting to go in. I mean, shoot, people are putting uh, wood blinds up and building them uh, during November. Big no-no. If you are after mature bucks. You know, a lot of people say, ah, don't worry about all this stuff. It's too complicated for hunting. That's not for this channel. You know, this channel is about doing your best. If you want the strategies, if you really want to try hard, and you actually want to do your best, you actually want to target the older bucks in the neighborhood, whatever age that is, then that's why we have this channel. It's about that strategy. If you're just out for a walk in the woods and you want to go sit on a stand, there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't want to employ any strategy, you don't want to worry about your wind, you don't want to care if it's a morning stand, afternoon stand, what a bedding area is for, you know, if you want to blow out your food sources, that's, that's, you know, if that's what you enjoy, then, you know, by all means, this is a different channel. Number seven, high pressure backside of cover. Think of this for gun stand. This has worked so well for me going back to the 80s, especially when I had to manage this hunt in small, tiny woodlots of several acres here, five acre woods, 10 acre woods, a fence row here. And what I really love to do during opening day of gun season is find that heavy brush, find where there's distant pressure on the outside of that brush a quarter mile away and sit on that backside funnel waiting for the bucks to come out. It's paid off over and over again on target bucks because you know a buck is betting on the neighbors in this giant parcel. You know they're gonna muck it up. They're driving with ATVs. They're walking all over the place. They're being loud. They're shooting smaller bucks, whatever it might be. You just sit on the backside and wait for them to pop out. It's a pretty easy uh, concept. And it's worked for us even over like a half mile area. I can think of a big giant one I shot with Jake by my side. It's maybe back in 2011, somewhere around there where it was the big one we're after, and I knew where there's pressure, uh, it was to the east, and we went in from a completely different area, went way around the backside, basically went in about three quarters of a mile away from this side where he would move through, and then the neighboring pressure was beyond that on the other side of the road, and we waited, and sure enough, he came in about 10 o'clock with a bunch of does, and I'm sure he was pushing them across the road, they make a lot of noise, they shoot a lot of deer over there, and just pushed them over. And what's cool about that is you always hear these guns going off on opening day. And yeah, there's a lot of big bucks shot. But, you know, a lot of times those big bucks, they know the game. When they see start seeing lights in the woods, they start hearing noises, car door slams, a lot more vehicle traffic in the morning. They hit to a honey hole that kept them safe. That's why they're three, four, five, six years old, depending on your area. And, uh, and they hole up and they just don't move. And a lot of times, a lot of our gun seasons, now, Minnesota is smack dab in the middle of the rut, a little bit different. And some of yours might be Michigan is not smack dab in the middle of the rut. It's towards the end. It's towards the end of daylight movement. A lot of times there's so many hunters that suppresses breeding activity just at night. You know, bucks are always breeding, bad weather, doesn't really matter, hot weather. They're always breeding, does are always being bred. But daylight movement really uh, falters. And I think a lot of times states are looking at they're averaging the entire rut, meaning they're looking at third, second rut and third rut numbers. And because the first rut, let's say the average date of just the first rut, if they looked at it separately, let's say it would be November 10th. But because they're figuring in the second rut too as part of the primary rut, now all of a sudden, instead of an average of November 10th or 10th being peak, then it shows it as the 14th being peak. And then they figure in the third rut, now the 16th is being peak and it's almost a week after peak because they're figuring in the next two months worth of second and third rut. So I hope that makes sense. So a lot of our, uh, a lot of our peak rut data is off because then I've been able to look at all of them from all the states. And you know it's off too because it, it literally, and I think you've heard me talk about this before, but a state line, it'll be uh, 10 days either side of that state line and you obviously know the deer don't know there's a state line even county lines can be drastically different if you've ever looked at a georgia rutting map it's it's all over the board i mean from one county to the next times 10 in different locations where it's different from one county drastically from one to the other back and forth it's crazy when you look at it, it can be all over the place the bottom line is hunt the back back side of that cover know that those bucks are going to move and they're not moving that much because of the rut Think about that. They're moving because of cover, getting away from other hunters, so set up accordingly. And then of course, those afternoon food sources during that time of year. I wanna hunt bucks that I feel can actually have their own thick cover and then are moving to that food source because if they don't have good cover, it's big open hardwoods next year, great pretty food plot. 
Well, don't expect those mature bucks to pop out during gun, sign, gun season anytime soon. We shoot a lot of our gun season bucks in the fourth day, seventh day, ninth day, and then on into muzzleloader, a lot of muzzleloader bucks because they're coming into those late season food sources. We have thick cover adjacent to those food sources and we don't spook it out. So be the one not spooking it out, getting on the side of cover, taking advantage of, side, of the back side of cover, and uh, you'll be on track in November. Number eight, count on the second rut. And what I mean by that, the second rut is real. It's an incredible opportunity. We've shot a lot of bucks during the second rut throughout the years, throughout the decades. A lot of our best bucks during that second rut, uh, bow too. And so what I mean by that is, again, you don't need to throw caution to the wind. You don't need to have poor stand management. You don't need to go all in for broke thinking this is my only chance. The second rut is real. It's just around the corner. And that's one more reason why the season is a marathon and not a sprint. Have some patience. Don't make any rash decisions. Try to be smart and calculated with every set. Every set has a purpose. Maybe you don't want to think about that. It's unenjoyable for the hunt to actually think about all that strategy. That's okay. This channel is, again, not for you. I want to help people, and I want to help you plan your November, and I really want you to have a great November. This is the month that we dream about all year long, let alone from the start of the season. And uh, the good thing is, if you mess it up, you always have the second rut, late season food sources, and still a lot of hunting opportunity the rest of the season. And that's why you need to plan for a lot of strategy in November. Don't throw that to the, to the side just because it's November and you have your rutcation. I appreciate you guys watching the YouTube channel, but I don't know if everyone knows everything that we have to offer, whether it's on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, our website, or WHS Wildlife Blends, our seed company. Also, Instagram you can check out. I'm very active on Instagram, putting strategies on there, photos of what we do every day. Uh, much more active there than Facebook. But our seed, web classes, books, clients, Articles, I have over 600 articles on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, everything whitetail strategy. Of course, we have hats on there, and then make sure to check us out on Instagram again. But lots of stuff to offer. We're always coming out with new things, and this isn't the end of it. We have more things coming soon. Make sure to check us out.